Joining me now on set is Molly Ball, senior political correspondent for The Wall Street Journal, Cornell Belcher, Democratic pollster and NBC News political analyst, and Stephen Hayes, editor and CEO of The Dispatch and also an NBC News political analyst. Happy New Year to all of you. Here we are in 2024. Thank you for joining me today. Molly, let me start with you and just get your reaction to everything we just heard from Governor DeSantis. I mean, it's striking to hear him say people here in Iowa don't ask me about January 6th. As Dasha said, people talk about it. I was in Iowa. Folks talked to me about it and said they broke with Donald Trump over that. What were your big takeaways from what you just heard from him? Yeah, there, I mean, there was so much, but I uh, in that answer and in so many others, what struck me was just the subtlety of this dance that Ron DeSantis is trying to do, right? You heard him there trying to triangulate, try to draw a wedge between Trump and his supporters by sort of pointing out like, oh, he's defending the January 6th rioters now, but what, where was he, you know, on his way out the door when he actually could have done something for them, trying to question his commitment to the January 6th rioters, but at the same time, not at all criticize him for what happened or, or what uh, or what he did that day, very similar to uh, the answer about the indictments, mm -hmm. right? Where he's saying, well, I'm not going to uh, actually criticize him for any of the things that he did because those are the things that Democrats criticize him for and I don't want to be perceived as on their side. And you just see the effectiveness of uh, Trump's technique of polarization, of divide and conquer, where Trump has positioned himself so you're either with him or against him, and there is no in-between, and that has meant that for Ron DeSantis, trying to find that space in between to say to people, I still love Trump, but aren't I better in all of these ways, it just has not been a viable message. Yeah, Stephen, what's been so striking about it is that here we are 11 days from the Iowa caucuses, and we are just really starting to see him find new ways to try to sharpen his tone, even as Molly rightfully yeah. points out, he's doing this very delicate dance of not going all the way, going the full right. Christie, if you will. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it, it's subtle, it's, it's nuanced, but it's also just incoherent. I mean, yeah. I think what we've seen in those answers is the reason that Ron DeSantis has fallen in the polling and is no longer Donald Trump's chief rival. Mm. He's trying to have it both ways on virtually everything and contradicting himself sometimes in the space of each sentence. I mean, he talks about how he doesn't want to smear Donald Trump. He doesn't believe in that. He's not going to fall for that. It's a media game. And yet at the same time, he, he's willing to say that Nikki Haley's a phony, that she's bought and paid for by Wall Street. I mean, he's smearing Nikki Haley, but he's not smearing mm. Donald Trump. That just tells you, I think, where his allegiance lies. And in the question about, you know, Donald Trump, whether Ron DeSantis would team up with Nikki Haley mm -hmm. to take on Donald Trump. And he said, well, you know, my supporters are probably going to be where Donald Trump is. I think that was a very revealing answer, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps unintentional. I, I think so as well. And the other revealing moment, Cornell, I thought was he really struggled. In fact, he didn't name another state that he thought he could win. Right. And oh, by the way, Trump's ahead by 37 points in right. Iowa. Right. And, and he said, it was striking to me, he said, I'm in for the long haul. Yeah. And he, but he's not, right? Take it, I mean, you don't have to be a campaign professional hack like I am to understand that <laughs> what has happened, he has burnt through an alarming amount of money mm. in a short period of time, which is, which is just malpractice for any campaign. He's now struggling with, with, with funding. He's had to pull back advertising from, 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 from key states, and he's focused now on one state. So he's, so he's, so he's, out, of, so he's out of funds, and, he's, and his polling numbers are, are, are collapsing. He's not in it for the long haul. Mm -hmm. I suspect that if he does not come in a, 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 a close second to Nikki Haley in Iowa, we will not see him very much longer on the campaign trail. I, I think that you're right that Iowa is going to force all of these candidates to ask themselves some really yes. tough questions. I want to turn to the current president, President Biden. He's going to be delivering a speech on democracy tomorrow in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. He is out with a new campaign ad. His speech tomorrow is going to focus on democracy. This ad focuses on democracy. I'm going to play a little bit, and we'll talk about it on the other side. There's something dangerous happening in America. There's an extremist movement that does not share the basic beliefs in our democracy. All of us are being asked right now, what will we do to maintain our democracy? History's watching. The world is watching. Most important, our children and grandchildren will hold us responsible. 
Cornell, what do you make of this messaging? What do you make of this strategy? It worked in 2020. You could argue it worked in 2022 20, 22 as well. As well, yes. Yeah. I, I would argue that it, did, it it helped push back the tide. Look, a lot of people questioned when 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 the president went to the, and I think he went to Philadelphia and yeah. he made the democracy speech then. He got was criticized. He got time. criticized. Yeah. And they should shut up. Those people criticize them <laughs> because him interjecting democracy and making democracy a key issue in that election helped turn the tide. Campaigns are, are actually not that difficult. You know, on, each candidate wants to determine what they want the debate to be about. Right. And what what this president is saying, what he wants this debate to be about is democracy and freedoms, because if that's what the debate's about, they like their chances. This was a this was a really good ad and it's a mm. really important point in time for the Biden campaign. Stephen, are Republicans getting jittery when they look at an ad like that, when they think about the issue of abortion, where a, a lot of Republican strategists acknowledge there's still no clear message when it comes to that issue that's critical to a lot of voters? Yeah, I mean, I, I think this ad and this sort of broader messaging has two advantages. One, it riles up the Democratic base. I mean, it reminds the Democratic base yeah. sort of what's at stake or the way that Joe Biden wants to frame what's at stake. The other thing it does is it appeals to people who, like the gentleman who asked the question of Ron DeSantis in Iowa yesterday, mm. you know, DeSantis said he never gets questions about that. That gentleman asked about the November 2020 election mm. and talked about Donald Trump lying about having won the election. It does matter to some group of people. And what it says to those people who are not probably very excited about Joe Biden as a second term president, it says to them, this matters more. And I think that's a pretty powerful argument for some independents and for some Republicans who are frustrated with Donald Trump. Molly, we're having this uh, discussion against the backdrop of a new poll which shows that a third of Republican voters believe the FBI organized or encouraged the January 6th attack on the Capitol, even though, of course, that's not the case. <laughs> How compelling of an argument is this? And what are we in for if we are in for this rematch between Biden and Trump? I mean, what struck me more than anything about that ad was the sense of continuity with Biden's mm. 2020 campaign. There was a clip in there of Charlottesville. Yes. And that was, Joe Biden said, the reason he ran in 2020. And it's still the reason he's running, because he sees this twilight struggle for the soul of the nation. And he believes we are still in it as long as we are still as he is still up against Donald Trump. And so that that is something that fundamentally has not changed. He said recently uh, at a fundraiser that he might not even be running if Trump mm. wasn't still in the race. And I think you see a, a, a real authenticity here. Now, the, that one third of Republicans certainly aren't going to find it believable. And Trump has done a very good job of uh, of making this a partisan issue and convincing a lot of his supporters uh, to believe his lies about the 2020 election and the January 6th riot. Uh, but for Biden, you can tell that this is still the animating issue driving his campaign. And the question is just, do enough Americans still see this the way he does? That is the key question. And this conversation will continue with 11 days to go until Iowa. Thank you so much for a great conversation, Molly Cornell and Stephen. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.